sure you take the right door on your way down. There's no telling where you might end up. Can you make it through? To the night's end. I'll see you soon. <laughs> Welcome back, fiends. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's episode. Today's episode of Questionable Morals teaches us that no matter your hunger, no matter what your craving is, you don't always have the ability to sate it. Or do we? This episode contains themes of cannibalism. Listener discretion is advised. Consumed. Written by Ophelia Vang and narrated by Narlan Brando. It took me a long time to understand my fascination with death. My sexual maturity coincided with the shock sights of the early 2000s, and I remember feeling so disgusted when I looked at dead bodies with a tinge of hunger. Meat grinder accident. Helicopter beheading. Man eats human fetus. Low resolution images from the most intimate moments of people's existence were branded into my head with searing white flames. Even now they glow. I felt guilty, but the meatiest ones, legs severed at the thigh, degloved limbs, those were the ones I would stare at the longest in the late hours of the night so that my family would never know. Somehow, looking at those images with the background static of puberty's relentless hormones, I started to associate it with gratification. My own body was not so fleshy. I always found it difficult to eat, no matter what was offered. I made excuses. I'm not hungry. I'm just a picky eater. Even so, for a while, I'd always been able to get something down. On particularly good days, I'd imagined that a pork chop was an exceptionally cooked piece of human. On those days, I ate well, so long as I could maneuver the pieces in a way that helped me suspend my disbelief. Those old sights, one by one, were shut down, and perhaps that was for the best. From then on, I lived in a vacuum. I became a diligent scholar on cannibalism. Gone was the gratuitous gore porn in favor of historic tragedy. I was just curious, I tell myself. Endo-cannibalism is cannibalism of one's own community. The most famous example of this would be the Donner Party, but it wasn't like they had a choice. It was also a funeral practice in the late 1800s in Papua New Guinea as a way to reintegrate the power of the member who had died, not that you had asked. Those same people were nearly wiped out by a disease called Kuru, gained from eating the organs and especially brains of humans. It's always fatal, with no treatment, like rabies. It takes about a year. They say the cause is transmission of prion proteins. Just a fun fact I happen to know. Terrer was an infamous Frenchman with intestines of sludge who swallowed an infant whole. The tale that inspired Moby Dick was of two men who were found sucking on the marrow of a bone on a raft. They sacrificed their crewmen after a whale had sunk their ship. Carl Denk is the forgotten cannibal despite having remnants of at least 40 people found in his home. During the famine of China's cultural revolution, neighbors traded their children so they wouldn't have to eat their own. Sagawa made his way through the inconsistencies of international law and published his memoir about killing and eating his college classmate. Dahmer, Chikatilo, Fish, Maiwis. Make no mistake, I'm not a psychopath. I'm not a sexual deviant. It isn't that I value my own pleasure over someone's life. I simply find beauty in the idea of the complete devotion and love of being able to give yourself over as sustenance. To partake in the most value and delicate of dishes. So many times I'd sat at the table of sexual desire to join my brethren in indulgence, and every time I could not eat, 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 eat. My throat sealed shut with cotton, my stomach churned, my lips would not part as I watched everyone merrily eating and drinking fruits of flesh, 
which burst in colorful shining beads of ambrosia. My own fruits of flesh were nowhere to be found in sex. The dull set art of cannibalism, fetishism, at large, had never appealed to me either. I don't want to fuck a woman pretending to be a pig. I don't have any bold, dominating expression to prove by eating flesh. It just seems that more and more, I can't open my lips for anything else. Somewhere along the line, the idea came to me, perhaps in the greater abundance of curiosity cases through the years. Journalists wanted to describe the taste of human flesh to discuss the ethics around cannibalism or make a point about the consumption of meat at large. Fetishists were open about turning their fantasies into reality. Macabre artists were collecting body parts for performance. Arturs Berzin, Zhu Yu, Reza Aslan. You can research cannibalism until you develop carpal tunnel, but it brings you no closer to being fulfilled. An addict can research the fastest way to rid themselves of the burden of reality. An anorexic can research how to cook the most delicious of dishes. There are two options from there. You either romanticize your suffering or you indulge. My eating had gotten worse and I had found that it was not only possible but accessible to order medical specimens for research. After learning that, my obsession continued to grow. My body refused to take in anything else. I inquired each and every source I could find for a fresh specimen, not a preserved one. Meat was preferable, but organs, even brain, was something I made attempt after attempt to acquire. I just had to know. It's about the stages of decay. My stomach toiled and nodded over itself as the thought of food finally entering it. I'm using it for an art project. Stretching it to its limits with what I can consume, I crave contact to the stretched and tanned lining of my stomach. Sorry if it seems gratuitous, it's for an experiment. My own insides must be leathered by disuse. So long as it's fresh. Every day I came closer and closer to finding a way to get human flesh into my hands. First, it was a company from the Philippines selling slices of brain. They shipped me a frozen box of brain sliced up as cleanly and casually as lemon bars. The only problem was that it would take two months. Still, I gladly paid the suspiciously inexpensive price as a first-timer. That was still two months away, and every day I grew more and more insatiably hungry, so I kept looking. A butcher known for wild and unique meats proved to be a bust, but at least he had a good sense of humor about the frequency with which he had been approached about the subject. A medical school student said she wasn't sure if she'd be able to find a time alone with the cadavers she was working on, but would keep an eye out for me. A form user said they knew a funeral director just a few hours away. Step by step, I ventured into bolder and bolder territory. Less stable, less legal, and less morally sound. Of course, there was no sure way to get a source of lemon bar sliced brain. There was no moral high ground I could stand on in the pilgrimage for tasting human flesh. A dream come true would be someone I loved enough to eat, to taste their flesh and have it be one with mine forever. My own wife's hand in marriage and then on the dinner plate. I never had asked her about the subject. She's far too squeamish. She had begun to worry about my long nights researching. My, I'll eat dinner later, honeys. My poor alienated wife stood in the doorway of my study with a fraught wringing of the hands. I set up a time to meet with the funeral director. I'd arrive at sunset funeral directors at three in the afternoon. It was far less conspicuous than arriving in the dead of night. I'd leave at 11 in the morning. I asked my wife if she needed anything while I was out. She declined and asked me to eat today. I told her I would. She seemed relieved. My hands gripped the steering wheel until threatening to rip through it, more than from passion or hunger. My grip was to ensure that my strength wouldn't fail me now for my lack of sustenance. The first hour was comfortable, familiar, but determined. My own city was easy to navigate. My college, the office of my colleagues, my children's favorite park dragged behind me as I left on my journey to become a changed person. It was the second hour that my stomach started to growl. I hadn't eaten even a morsel in three days. 
My wife had made me soup, which I drank to aid in my lethargy. I was beyond hunger, but knowing that in just a few short hours, I would have the flesh I craved in my grasp made it grow and grow like thundering waves of a treacherous ocean. I was hungry. It started to burn rather than the dull ache I had accepted as part of my normal experience. I started to speed up along the droning highway. Miles and empty miles of dusty hills and sparse trees whizzed past. Somehow, I gained enough composure before the sign of my exit came, and it seemed that those hours, however anxious, went by quickly. Body brokers, they're called. It's as normal as going to the pharmacy for these people, but I looked over my shoulder at every step. My stomach gurgled as I repeated my name, and despite the receptionist's smile, I felt it revealed to her my intention for the sample. $700 later, I was back in my car with a cooler containing a specimen of human arm. Refrigerated. I sat with it in my passenger seat. My shuddering, wispy body sat with unease, winded from the short but panicked jog back to my car. They just let me walk out with this? I wanted to see. I didn't dare check on it inside for fear of losing myself. Even in the safety of my own car, I felt exposed. I was surrounded on all sides by windows, by other cars which people may walk up to at any moment. I had to go somewhere more private before I even thought about opening that cooler. Already, my hands wanted to feel the weight of it again, to marvel at the amount of fresh meat I was able to get my hands on, and I drove. It seemed like it took ages to find a private place in the unfamiliar town. As I had gone on, my desperation wore down the battle with solitude, and I compromised at a mostly empty park. Before me, in the parking lot, was a lake crowned by a walking trail. The occasional duck trotted past, and the occasional jogger disrupted them. It was in what was possibly one of the most unremarkable environments I could that I opened up my marvelous package. I lifted the heavy cooler onto my lap, taking a deep breath as if bracing to face its contents. I pushed the lid open. Inside was a demure paper parcel, hiding from me still. I could see the shape of the shoulder bone, a complicated piece of the human body, wasn't it? It was with great affection that I lifted the top of the bicep, disrobing it of its paper prison. The radiant red flesh of the recently deceased beckoned me. The texture of carved meat reached out to grab me, and then and there, with the fire in my stomach, the smell of delectable meat wafting from right between my hands, I bit into the meat of the arm. Raw. It tasted of blood. It was cold. It was tougher than I had expected, and I had to pull hard until a piece came off into my mouth. Bitter. Rich. So sweet. My starvation had opened my senses and allowed me to become enlightened to each and every facet of the flavor of human meat. They say that one should cook meat minimally to enjoy its most pure flavor. And here I was, gnawing on an arm in a parking lot, and I couldn't stop. I bit again and again. It was compulsive to fill my mouth with as much meat as I could, chew it down, swallow, and go again. I regretted each swallow that didn't allow me to savor that taste for just a little bit longer. The shoulder joint was complicated, and I moved past it by gnawing and sucking the meat from each of its intricate parts. I spit out a ligament that found its way between my teeth in my ravenous frenzy. It fell into the cup holder. As I grew more satisfied, I slowed and decided that I'd like to try a leg next time, if I was so lucky to get the opportunity after being as bold as this. I wanted to put the rest of the arm down. With every bite I tried, but it was as if my own wouldn't budge in any direction but towards my mouth. Finally, after consuming half of the upper arm in a matter of mere minutes in my trance, I was able to wrap the rest of the arm up, bite marks and all, and replace it into the cooler. I drove home, even more giddy and excited than before. The drive itself was long enough to contemplate. Had it been so easy this entire time? Still. As fulfilling as it had been, I wanted even more. I wanted flesh from the living, an extension of devotion. This was masturbation compared to making love. When you haven't been able to do either, though, you go crazy. 
I got home and I was still full of vigor. It was as if my blood was moved for the first time. Months and months, years and years of not being able to eat enough, never having enough energy, pale and sickly, and finally, there was sustenance in me. Honey, you're back. My wife greeted me, so warm and sweet. How diligently she always prepared my meals, knowing I wouldn't do it for myself. How delicately she toiled over my illness. She was a timid woman who settled into a housewife role. It was never either of our intentions, but it had certainly been a comfortable conclusion for us both and allowed her to focus on her painting. I looked at her with a hunger I hadn't felt in years and returned her greeting by dropping my bag at the doorframe and spreading my arms wide to enrobe her in my grasp. Insatiably, I kissed her and she gasped in her surprise at my newfound passion. What's gotten into you? She asked with a pleasant hum. I ate. She seemed even more elated and started to return the affection in a way I know she'd missed in the face of my illness. She didn't even seem to notice the taste of blood and flesh on my tongue. I practically lifted her, driving her to the bedroom to lay her across the sheets. Finally, I'd have her once more. She cooed out playfully as I nestled my lips into her neck, holding her down. I encroached upon her to fill my ravenous appetite in more ways than one. I took a bite. You've been listening to the Night's End Podcast, Halloween 2022 Special, a production of Dissonance Media. Consumed was written by Ophelia Vang. Ophelia is found on most social media as at Skittlepunk and has a novel and micro anthology currently available with a novella and novel series releasing next year. This episode was narrated by Narlan Brando. To connect with Narlan, you can find him on Twitter at Narlan Brando or for more scary content, head to wordsfrombehindthemask.com. This episode was produced and edited by James Barnett. The Night's End Halloween theme was composed by Duncan Muggleton. For more from Duncan, head to twitter.com forward slash Duncan Muggleton. Stay horrific, everyone.